All right, I'll cut you off there, guys. Uh, really interesting. I'm uh, so grateful to have uh, Pastor Andy with us tonight. Um, Andy was uh, a previous pastor here at Oakton, uh, but you left us. Yep. Well, we kind of sent you. Do you want to describe that history and, uh, yeah. yeah, where you've been? And yeah, it was um, started here in 2012, um, but actually grew up here in this church. So uh, it's a special place in my heart. It's been an incredible blessing to me to be part of this church. Um, 2012, became a pastor here, did music and young adults, 2012, and then did that for a couple of years in 2015. 15, we went to America for, for that year and studied and then came back in 2016 and planted City Ridge Church for nice. the first one. So, yeah. What's it like uh, planting a church in the West? Ah, it's a big question. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's been a, amazing. It's strengthened my faith as a Christian, not as a, as a pastor or a leader, but as a Christian because uh, this principle of stepping out in faith applies to every every person and when you step out in faith God supplies what's needed and he blesses you and and meets you in your in your in the place of need so yeah yeah, it's been a blessing it's been fantastic well thank you so much Andy for being here tonight we really appreciate your faithfulness and and look forward to sitting under the word tonight no worries awesome well um all of that uh happened um about four uh 180 years before the birth of Jesus I was just wondering what that crack of noise was. <laughs> Realised that the rain's coming and the thunder's here. But that whole story about 480 to 500 years before Jesus came. And listening to that whole story, you pick up what type of literature uh, the book of Esther is. It's a story. But that's not to say that it isn't real. Uh, it's still real. These are historical events in ancient Persia. So modern day, think modern day Iran. And there's other history that's outside of the Bible. There's other archaeology which kind of affirms uh, this kind of event happening, uh, this, this story happening. But the author is retelling these events to a particular audience sometime later using typical storytelling techniques. So humor, satire, suspense. In fact, I heard a few sniggers as it was being read out a few times, and that is exactly how it ought to be received. There's some things that are humorous about this story. But the author has a particular point in mind, and it's kind of left to us to work out what the point of that story is. And sometimes working out the point of the story is a little bit difficult, because this is two and a half thousand years ago. It's in a a culture that's foreign to us. It was originally written in Hebrew in a certain kind of style. And so we don't always immediately pick up what the point of the story is. And there's no kind of obvious instructions to follow either. Like a New Testament book like Ephesians, it kind of tells you, you know, not to do this and and sort of to do this. And so it's sort of clear. Um, But sometimes when you're listening to a story, it's not always easy to work out, well, what is good or bad? Was that a good thing that they did? Or was that a bad thing? Should I be doing that or should I not be doing this? And so you're kind of left to work it out on your own. But I want to just give you a few helpful tips as you go on this journey of studying the book of Esther over the next couple of weeks. The first thing is this, is to not try and be the hero of the story. Sometimes we look at the characters of the Old Testament, any of the stories and accounts of the Old Testament, we try to sort of put ourselves in the place of being like a David or an Esther or a Daniel or something like that. And we try to sort of, you know, work out whether we could sort of be like them. And there is some good things to take from that. There's definitely some things you can learn about David's life and Daniel's life and Esther and Mordecai's life. But the primary point of the story is not to see ourselves as the hero of it. There's something deeper to actually look at in that. And, and, and that's actually a good thing for us because sometimes looking at these uh, characters of the Bible and the great wisdom that they have or the great courage or strength that they show can actually be a little bit crushing for us if we compare ourselves to them because we could sort of find that we don't have uh, the, the will or the resources to act in the way that we do. So look a little bit deeper than seeing yourself as the hero. The second thing is to look for more than morality. Look for just uh, whether some, someone, that something that someone did was good or, or bad. Sometimes when we read stories like this, we tend to kind of, you know, cheer the goodies, like, yeah, go, and then we boo the baddies, like, boo, 
you know, that's, that's terrible. And we sort of try and put ourselves on one side or the other, typically the good side. But the interesting thing that you'll find as you go through Esther is it's not always easy to discern whether their actions were good or not. There's, a, there's actually some things that Esther does and Mordecai does, and you sort of think, hmm, is that really a good action to follow? And so you actually have to look a little bit deeper than just about what is uh, good and moral and what is not. Otherwise, we turn faith into just doing good things or doing bad things. The third thing is, th- is this, to look for God and the need for his son, Jesus. God is the hero of all the Old Testament stories. And oftentimes what we find when we look closely at these Old Testament stories is some kind of type or figure of Jesus Christ, who at that time is still sort of yet to come into the world. But the story kind of exposes a deep need for him and some of the characters display some of the ultimate work of Jesus Christ. And so we ought to look for God and look for the need uh, for his son, Jesus. Now, having said that, to look for God, as Ollie said, there's a big problem with that in the book of Esther because there is not one mention of God in the book of Esther. So how are we going to find him if there's not one mention of God? And, you know, you can sort of ask yourself, like, where is God in this story as you heard it? I mean, what, it's almost like this Hollywood thriller kind of story. Where is God in the midst of that? But maybe that's the exact point of the book of Esther. We're being invited to ask that very question. Who is God and where in the world is he? Now, let's get real for a moment. You ponder that question sometimes, don't you? As you look at the chaotic world around you in this year 2020, you think, where is God? I've had that come home to my heart with intensity just even this last week. I was uh, reading in my room and um, one night my wife came in and she was, she was in tears. So I sort of sat up and said, are you okay, darling? What, what's going on? And she sort of said, oh, you're going to think I'm silly. Uh, but she eventually was able to share with me that she'd been sitting on the couch and she saw this picture. And you may have seen this picture of a young, um, small African child who's close to death lying on the ground with a vulture lying nearby. And you see these images of our world and you think, man, can we bear this? Can we bear this in the world? And we ask ourselves, where is God in the midst of these things? Some of you from here from Oakden might have joined in on the child safe training we did this week uh, on Zoom. Uh, I sat in on that and you just hear these stories, these tragic stories. Some of them just made me want to vomit. There's some of the, the, the evil and the darkness that's in our world and you think to yourself, man, where is God in the midst of these things? God, sometimes God seems more absent than he is present. Uh, no matter how much we sort of cry out, we just don't seem to be able to, to feel God or sense that he's actually present and that he's good. And there is this cultural tide that is actually against Christianity. You wonder what it's going to be like in 20 to 30 years to follow Jesus. Is it actually going to be worth it to be part of such a minority group? You know, only 12% of 18 to 34-year-olds in the last census said that they were Christian. Only 12% of 18 to 34-year-olds, that's the next generation. Is it going to be a really exciting thing to be part of Christianity in 20 to 30 years' time? And you add to that uh, the mass distractions that we face in our world, that we're faced with, the beautiful world, the impressive world, the lifestyles of the rich and famous that we're all lured by, the empire of pleasure. And you see that we're really, we're up, we're up against it in the time that we live. Where is God in the midst of this? Well, I want to sort of look at this like a movie and scene one is of a, let me just see if that's working, just flick it to the next one, Luke, is, is a scene of a wild party. And the opening scene is kind of like this aerial shot uh, that kind of zooms over to this incredible, beautiful and impressive, impressive city. And you have this powerful Persian king who rules over 127 provinces all the way from India to Ethiopia. And we're taken into his kind of winter royal palace of this king who decides to throw off this wild party so that he can show all his glory and his power. Nothing less than a 180-day party will do. It's going to take six months to show off this guy's power and his glory. And to show all the nobles and the governors of all the 127 provinces just how great he is. And when that party's over, 
at the end of the six months, he throws this uh, further seven-day party for all the people in the headquarters, kind of like all the plebs, you know, who they're included in for this all-you-can-eat, kind of all-you-can-drink sort of party. And we're being shown in the text, you actually see it in chapter one, how lavish this thing is. The author goes to an extent to show us this. There, there were white cotton curtains and there's violet hangings fashioned with cords of fine linen, silver rods and marble pillars and couches of gold, marble, mother of pearl, drinking from gold vessels. And there's no restrictions on drinking. And this is the kind of modern image that I get. This is kind of like Leo from the great Gatsby. Verse 8 says, For the king had given orders to all the staff of his palace to do as each man desired. And so it's loose. Or while the, why the wild party? It's not just for fun and debauchery. No, the king wants everybody to look at him like this. To look at him with amazement. You are glorious. There's this aura that he wants around him. The glow of greatness. But then from verse 10, we move to scene two, and a royal scandal that is brewing. It's the final day of the feast, so six month and one week party. And it's coming to an end, and the, the king's heart is merry with wine, which is the Bible's way of, you know, saying he's drunk. And he calls for his wife, the queen, Vashti, to be brought out in front of everyone so that pretty much everyone can ogle her because she's very beautiful. Sorry, ladies, this is quite blokey. And we're specifically told that she's beautiful. And so to bring her out to parade is like the king saying, you've seen all my glory for six months, you wait till you see this. He knows that even Vashti's beauty makes him look even better, because you can't have him and she's mine. But there's this unexpected problem. A scandal is brewing because when the servants go to fetch her, Vashti refused to come. And all the women here go, yeah, you go, girl. Christopher Ashe, one of the commentators, quite humorously said this, you can see it now, Vashti says no, hashtag Vashti says no. This is an incredible scandal for the empire, a total embarrassment for the king, and he's having this full-blown tantrum because this is the worst possible way for the six-month party to end. How humiliating for his ego. But for all of us who are watching this unfold, we think this is actually quite funny. This is quite hilarious. In fact, we're all supposed to be doing something like this. We're all supposed to be laughing. The author wants us to see how funny it really is that Vashti has said no. Because think about it, here you have this impressive king who rules over 127 provinces with wealth to throw a six-month and one-week party, and he can't even get his own wife to obey him. This is ridiculous. This is a scandal. This is a joke. And maybe at this point of the story in chapter one, we're learning that the impressive empire isn't actually that impressive after all. And so scene three is like this hilarious PR mess, a public relations mess. All the political strategists of the king, they're sort of ushered into the palace to kind of fix the scandal. And in verse 16, there's this guy called Memucan, who I call an enabler around power-hungry men. There's always people who enable that power to continue and that destructive behavior to, ki to continue. And here's this perfect piece of bait for the king who is so concerned about appearances and, and his ego. And he says to the king, King, not only has Vashti done wrong to you, but to all the men of the city. You see, once all the women find out what Vashti has done, they'll think that they can disobey their husbands too. It's like red rag to a bull. He's trying to kind of bait him. In other words, we've got to get on top of this potential uprising of women across all the land. And so this enabler suggests doing two things. One, we banish Vashti forever. That will send a strong message to anyone thinking about embarrassing the king again. So we banish her. And then we put out a law that all women must obey their husbands. There's a bit of overkill here. But this is all part of the, the joke of the empire. This powerful king who can have and demand anything he wants and can give 
people anything they want. He can't even have his own wife now. And not only has to banish her, but even pass a law to force other women to honour their husbands who haven't even done anything wrong. How insecure do you have to be? How laughable. The public relations crew of the palace have tried to contain the king's embarrassment, but by putting the decree out wide and far, they end up telling people about it anyway. Imagine all the people in the streets. Vashti said no, and now the king's feeling like he's losing control, and so he's putting out this law. The average punters, we're not stupid, are we? We, we know when authority and power is scrambling and, and insecure. But ironically, verse 21 tells us that this petty kind of over-the-top response, it pleased the king. Well, of course it did, because he's all about his ego and keeping it intact. I wonder if you ever find yourself kind of laughing a little bit inside, sniggering at the empire, at seeing the world around us. I mean, sometimes the, the policies, the plans, the grand statements of their success and glory kind of only end up with egg on their face. The empire we live in looks impressive with its beauty and enticements and leaders and social media influences, but peel back the layers and it's actually a bit of a joke. It's not that impressive at all. Our Western celebrity culture seems like one big hilarious PR exercise to clean up images and egos. And we can either lust for a piece of that too, or we can sit back and kind of laugh because it's all folly. Well, scene four is what you might call a grubby beauty pageant. It's a, a few years later, and the king has been off fighting the Greeks. In fact, it's pretty much this movie happens in this period. I'm not kidding. This, this movie of the, the, um, the Spartans uh, rising up against Persia and then being defeated actually happens right in this, this period of time. And even though he had made this big show of strength against Vashti and throughout the empire, he actually kind of, kind of misses her. It says he kind of regrets it. And he's forgotten why he was so angry and he's having, you know, real regret. It shows how trivial it all actually was. And we don't know where Vashti is, but it would be out of the question to go and find Ashti, Vashti and reinstate state her because that would be like admitting error. And so all of the, the, the king's, you know, kind of brigade of the palace, they come in and they kind of bandage the king's aching heart with a plan. And the plan is to bring in all the beautiful young virgins of the empire so that the king could choose a replacement for Queen Vashti. And this is no ordinary beauty pageant. It's a bit more grubby than that. And we see how it unfolded in chapter 2, verse 12. The women would come in and they don't actually get to meet the king for 12 months. In fact, what they do is they go through this kind of beauty treatment, so they bathe in spices and ointments and perfumes so that their king is perfectly, skin is perfectly soft and supple for the king when they meet him. And then once the beautifying process was over, one by one, they would go in and spend a night with the king, and you can sort of kind of guess that he wasn't just interested in their personality type. Now, of course, this is 5th century uh, you know, BC mainstream Persian culture, and so we actually have to be careful about reading our kind of values into it. But what it does show is the incredible vulnerable vulnerability of people on the other side of power in any culture. Not only are young virgins marched into this king's harem, but even young boys are brought in and they're made eunuchs, and so they're castrated for the purpose of serving the king. It's vulnerable being on the other side of power. If you're on the wrong side of power in a, in a culture, you're, you're very much at the mercy of those decisions. And so chapter one is at pains to show us the impressiveness of power, of authority, of control, of ego. And chapter two is at pains to show us the weakness and frailty of the minority, what it's like to be part of the minority. And in that, and out of that, we see scene five, and the rise of an unlikely queen. We meet Esther, and she's introduced as a picture of weakness and vulnerability. 
And we might ask ourselves, what is she doing in a place like that? What is she doing there? And the genuine answer is, is that we, at this point of the story at least, is that we don't actually really know yet. We don't know why she's there, but here's what we do know about Esther. We know that Esther was an orphan girl. She has an incredibly vulnerable start to her life with both her mother and her father dying at a young age. But she was adopted by uh, her relative, Mordecai, who becomes like her adoptive father. And they were Jewish. And so they're a minority people who are living in the Persian Empire, perhaps quite sensitive about people knowing that. It's not a great thing for people to know that because of Israel's history and their beliefs and their cultures, culture and traditions. We know that Esther was beautiful. The statement she was lovely to look at was the same thing said about Queen Vashti. And so there's clearly a comparison being made here. And so she's taken as one of the young virgins into the king's harem. And the comparison is interesting because Vashti refused the demands of the king. She refused to come out and be ogled at. But you might have heard in the story it was was read out that Esther is in every way compliant with his requests. And he actually wins, she actually wins favor with the harem leader and she earns her privileges. And we wondered to ourselves, what's she doing here? Why is she so compliant with the king to do everything that pleases him? She's vulnerable, let's no, make no mistake about that. And it's complex. But remember, it was complex for Daniel and his friends, three friends in Babylon too. When Nebuchadnezzar tried to culturally brainwash them with his practices and food. But they refused it all to risk their own lives. And in the end, Daniel actually rises to the halls of power by making a stand for God. But Esther doesn't refuse at all. She rises to the position of the Queen of Persia by pleasing all the requests of the Persian king. But this is the moment that I talked about at the beginning where the point is not to try and evaluate as a primary task Esther's morality and draw conclusions about whether she should have been there or not. The point is to see that it has happened and to see if you can understand why this Jewish orphan girl has become a beautiful Persian queen. And we see it partially in scene six with a foiled assassination that happens. Esther is now the queen of Persia and it's time to kind of wrap up the first episode of chapter one and two. All the exciting stuff actually doesn't happen until you meet Haman and beyond that you'll see in future weeks. But before it does move on, there's a little teaser of what is to come at the end of chapter two. You see, Mordecai, Esther's cousin, her adoptive father, is at the city gate and he's some kind of civil servant. And he overhears two men who are angry with the king and want to kill the king. Well, unlucky for them, Mordecai has a link into the palace now, doesn't he? That he didn't have before, because Esther is the queen. Well, he feeds the information to Esther about the plot, and Esther feeds the information to the king, and it's found to be true, and those two fellows are hanged. And this little episode is over, and it's recorded in the king's book which is a very important fact for something that happens later on. And all of a sudden, we realize that the king has been saved by the unlikeliest pair of heroes, Mordecai and Esther, the Jewish civil servant and his orphan child. The picture of weakness on the wrong side of power used to perform an amazing rescue of a king supposed to be the most powerful man in the known world. Human power is made laughable by weakness and frailty. At this point of the story, we don't even kind of know the half of it, but we start to piece all the scenes together and realize that none of this has been random. You see, if the king hadn't got drunk, he wouldn't have called for Queen Vashti. If Vashti hadn't refused to come, then she'd still be the queen. If she was still the queen, then Esther would not be the queen. 
If Esther wasn't the queen, then Mordecai wouldn't have been able to tell her of the plot to kill the king. And without then, it never would have been recorded in the king's book what Mordecai did for the king. And the king would most likely be dead. And what we find out later is that without that king and the record of Mordecai's actions, the lives of all the Jews in Persia would be in very grave danger. And for the, so for the first time, you start to see that there's actually some architecture to this story and to all these strange events. And behind it is actually a masterful architect weaving a rescue plan for his covenant people through incredible weakness. And so where in the world is God in this story? The answer is, is that he's there. And through the helplessness of the weak to fulfill his purposes. Not long after this, the biblical record of history actually falls silent. And for three to four hundred years, you actually have this silence where no prophets speak and there's no word of the Lord. Three to four hundred years, no prophets are sent to be God's mouthpiece. It's like God completely went silent while the Persians and the Greeks kind of fight it out for who's the most powerful ruler in the empires of the world. But then at the right time, after a seeming silence forever, a little baby is born in Bethlehem in the middle of the reign of a world superpower named Herod and Rome. And through the weakness of a mere baby would come a miraculous rescue, not just for Israel, but for the whole world. Who is God and where in the world is he? He's the the sovereign architect of the universe, working all things together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. And he used the weakness of his son, born as a baby on earth, crucified on a criminal's cross, to demonstrate his power over sin and death and all human strength. God uses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. What does this actually mean for you? What does it mean for us? as you actually live in the empire, as you live this week in the world that you live in, the world where it's not always obvious what God is doing. The first thing is this, I have three short things for you. The first thing is this, is to hope not in appearances. Don't be disheartened when you see the prospering of the world without God. Don't be alarmed when it seems like God's people are shrinking and people are deserting. Because nothing is quite as it seems. God is working about his purposes through the seeming weakness of the gospel. In the world's eyes, it's weakness, but in God's, it's the power unto salvation. 1 Corinthians 1.28 says that God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. God is the hero and he's bringing salvation through weakness. Well, hoping not in appearances also means that you're going to see some enticingly impressive and beautiful things this week. Men, women, houses, leaders, billboards, influencers, don't put your hope in them. They're not as impressive as you think. You can have a kind of hope that kind of laughs because it's just not that good after all compared to what God is preparing for those who love him. But also you're going to see some things this week probably that make you shudder. This world is a a cruel place and you'll see it in different ways. People on the wrong side of power. Christians around the world who are on the wrong side of power and increasingly that way in the West. But you don't shudder without hope because God is working through all these things, even through weakness, to bring a great salvation. Maybe there's somebody in your life that you've underestimated on the basis of appearance. You've pigeonholed them because of appearance. And maybe it's time to look more closely and give them another chance and not to put your hope in appearances. This this story reminds us that you can have a terrible start in life You can have a vulnerable start in life with all kinds of tragedies and bad decisions and God can still work them all for his glory and your joy. Well, let's get even more kind of personal. Maybe there's a a guy or a girl that you're overlooking. 
because they're not quite the picture that you had in mind. We tend to choose our partners by focusing on appearance first and then seeing if they have character. But actually, we ought not to put our hope in appearances. We ought to trust God and look to God and see how God might be working something that we didn't expect. What about in the church? God works through impressive types, doesn't he? Only the impressive types. He works through people with all the gifts and the charisma. But maybe it's time to look more closely and show no partiality. Because God uses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. That's the first thing out of this this message. Hope not in appearances this week as you live in the empire that we live in. The second thing is this. Remember God's coincidences. Remember that in our exodus, if you remember, God sends plagues upon the bad guys. And then he opens up the Red Sea and in Daniel, he shows up in a fiery furnace and shuts the mouth of hungry lions. And often in times of difficulty, we're looking for a miracle moment like that too. And it's not that we shouldn't ask, we should. We should ask for that. But the book of Esther reminds us to also look for God in the ordinary too. To look back on your life and to see how God has used all the hard things, the painful things, the broken things, and how he has been working even in weakness for our good. I see that in my own life. I look back and I remember some times of deep wounding in my life. I couldn't work out what God was doing in my life. But without those things, I wouldn't have learnt the serious lessons that I've needed to learn in order uh, to, to do what I'm doing now. I would be far away from God today if I hadn't experienced those things. But even through my wrongdoing, he has led me to himself to be part of his rescue. You might be here today and God has kind of has you here listening to this for the very person purpose that you would ask him to rescue your soul from sin and death and claim his forgiveness. Look for God in the ordinary. Look for God in the coincidences of life. And the third thing is this, is to simply trust his promises. It's interesting in this story that Mordecai tells Esther to keep her Jewishness quiet for now. And I've wondered why, and you actually see that later. It's advantageous for her to have kept it quiet. But it seems to me that Mordecai had a larger awareness of the promises made to his forefather Abraham about the nation of Israel. And he seems, as you go on, to act in this story with a great deal of certainty that better days are to come for his people. That's what we must do too. We have to live in the empire not on the empty promises of the empire, but on the promises of God. The reality that there are better days to come. The promise of a future deliverance to come. And those days will certainly be better. Well, King Ahasuerus' kingdom was so big that it took six months for him to show off the glory of his kingdom. Did you know in Ephesians 2 verse 7, it tells us that in the coming ages, those, these better days to come, Jesus will show us the immeasurable riches of his glory and grace. You know, it's going to take all the ages of eternity to show you the greatness and the glory of that. You're not going to get bored in heaven. It's going to take a lot longer than six months. It's going to take all the ages of eternity to show you how good he is. And that's the promise, is to trust in Jesus Christ in the empire that we live in. It sounds like foolishness. It really does. It sounds like weakness but it's the power of God unto salvation. It's the way that we can actually hope with some laughter. And it's the way that we will sometimes shudder at the cruelty of this world, but not without hope. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are the sovereign architect of all things. Lord, this word reminds us that sometimes it seems like you're absent and it seems like your people are shrinking 
and that they have no hope. But we're reminded in this book that you have a rescue plan for your people. You always preserve your people and you are faithful. And so therefore we can trust you. I pray quite simply, Lord, for those who are in complicated situations at the moment in their life. And it's not clear one way or the other. And it's also not clear what you are doing in the midst of that. I pray, Lord God, that they might fix their hope on something that is more than the appearance of the situation. But they would put their hope in you, our sovereign God. And so, Lord, I pray for that, for anybody here who's in a situation like that. And Lord, I pray that you also might help us to grow in understanding what your promises are and to apply them daily to our life so that when we're accused by the enemy or when our flesh rears up, we actually have resources there to be able to say, no, this is what your word says. This is what is true. So I pray for that for anybody too who's just struggling in that that we would actually claim your promises. Lord, I pray a blessing on this church and I pray that as they study this book of Esther that you would really speak and really move and that you would really grow the confidence of these people, Lord, in who you are. It's unshakable who you are. And I just pray that we would anchor ourselves in your character, Lord God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Let's all stand together as we close in a time of singing.